Hello, fellow history buffs and taffophiles. Today, we are going to dive into the life of Zachary Smith Reynolds, a promising young aviator who was set to inherit millions of his father's success. The story of Zachary, or Smith as he was often called, starts with his parents, particularly his father, Richard Joshua Reynolds. Richard, or RJ, formed the RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company in 1875 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. RJ was born to tobacco farmer Hardin Reynolds and his wife Nancy Cox on Rock Spring Plantation, or what is now known as the Reynolds Homestead near Critz, Virginia. I want to talk about Rock Spring Plantation for a moment because it has a deep and not so wonderful history. Hardin's father, Abram Reynolds, and his wife Polly started the homestead in the 1810s. By 1825, the Reynolds family had purchased 598 acres of land at the base of No Business Mountain. This is where the Reynolds homestead would be built in 1843 by Hardin. Now, the plantation didn't just stay at 598 acres, it grew to thousands and thousands of acres, most of which were for growing tobacco. The entire plantation was split into three plantations, Rock Spring, where the family home sat, North Mayo, and South Mayo. Of course, not just the Reynolds family lived here, but by 1863, it was also home to about 88 enslaved men, women, and children. Additionally, there is an enslaved cemetery on the property that holds about 60 individuals. There is so much to discuss when it comes to the lives of the enslaved individuals at Rock Spring Plantation, but I will urge you to learn and read more by visiting the Reynolds Homestead Museum website. They have done a wonderful job at outlining the lives of the enslaved people on the plantation and have included research that started in 2000 on the plantation and the enslaved cemetery. Let's revisit R.J. Reynolds. He was one of 16 children and one of eight that lived to be an adult. RJ worked with his father in the tobacco business and attended Emory and Henry College from 1868 to 1870 and eventually graduated from Bryan and Stratton College in Baltimore. In 1874, RJ sold his shares in his father's tobacco business and moved to Winston, North Carolina. Winston and Salem were two separate towns before they became one, now known as Winston-Salem. A year later, in 1875, R.J. established his own tobacco manufacturing operation. It said in its first year it produced 150,000 pounds of tobacco. R.J. had to really distinguish himself because at that time, there were already about 15 tobacco companies in the Winston-Salem area. By 1890, production had increased to millions of pounds annually, and on February 11th, 1890, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company was chartered as a corporation by the state of North Carolina. R.J. married Mary Catherine Smith on February 27, 1905 in Mount Airy, North Carolina. There are a few things to note about this partnership. Catherine was 30 years younger than R.J. When they got married, R.J. was 55 and Catherine was 25. Also, R.J. and Catherine's father, Zachary Smith, were cousins, so R.J. had known Catherine since she was a child. Now, marrying cousins or marrying in the family was not super unusual at this time, but the age difference could certainly give someone pause. From what I've read and what sources have said, the marriage was a happy one, and Catherine even urged her husband to continue to improve working conditions for their company's employees. Overall, it is said the Reynolds were extremely generous employers, building a small company town, granting endowments to a variety of organizations, and RJ was the first Southern man to build a hospital serving African Americans in the South, known as Slater Hospital. In 1913, the RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company did something simply innovative for the time and developed packaged cigarettes. Now, at that time in history, most smokers preferred to roll their own cigarettes, so there was a big question on if prepackaged would even take off. But to create even more appeal, RJ developed a new flavor and ended up creating the Camel Cigarette. Within the year, they ended up selling 425 million camels. 
Needless to say, the risk paid off. All while building this empire, RJ and Catherine had four children over the course of five years. Firstborn was Richard Joshua Jr. in 1906, second, Mary Catherine in 1908, third, Nancy Susan in 1910, and lastly was Zachary Smith in 1911. In 1917, the Reynolds family moved to the Ronalda House, which was an 1,000-acre estate outside of Winston-Salem and was also located where the company town was built. Shortly after, Father R.J. passed away in 1918 from pancreatic cancer. At his death, he was the wealthiest man in North Carolina and owned 121 buildings in Winston-Salem. RJ's brother, William, who was already part owner of the company, assumed full control of RJ Reynolds Tobacco Company. I want to note that in RJ's will, the money he set for each of his children to inherit could only be accessible after they turned 28 years old. I will also note that Catherine did end up remarrying in 1921, but would pass away shortly after in 1924. Regardless of all those changes, the company went on to have many more years of success, and not just in tobacco. They purchased Del Monte Foods in 1979 and merged with Nabisco in 1985. By the 1970s, they had diversified products a lot, so they ended up renaming the company R.J. Reynolds Industry Inc. and making R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company a subsidiary. There have been lots of spin-offs and changes since, but the now-known Reynolds American Inc. is still going strong. Now, with that brief history lesson aside, we can now learn about the youngest Reynolds child, Zachary Smith. Smith attended both Woodbury Forest School and Richard J. Reynolds High School, but by 15 he dropped out completely and went to go work with his older brother, Richard Jr. or Dick, at the newly founded spin-off company, Reynolds Aviation. Both Reynolds boys were avid aviators, and in 1926, Smith took his first flying lesson. It is said that the boys would practice takeoff and landing in the front lawn of the Ronalda house. By 1928, Smith had purchased a new plane, pilot's insurance, aviation club memberships, and a variety of other items, and was certainly dedicated to pursuing aviation full-time. On August 1st, 1928, at 16, he earned his private pilot's license. In May 1929, at 17, he earned his transport pilot's license and airframe and engine mechanics license. He was the youngest person in the country at the time to hold a transport pilot's license. In the summer of 1929, Smith began dating Anne Ludlow Cannon, the heiress of Cannon Mills Textile Company. Shortly after, in November 1929, they would get married. The marriage was unhappy and unhealthy. Smith had a terrible temper, and it manifested in many ways. Regardless, Anne would become pregnant and give birth to a daughter, Anne Cannon, on August 23, 1930. Smith and Anne would separate while Anne was still pregnant. I'm going to take a couple steps back, because shortly after Smith and Anne were married, Smith was introduced to Broadway star Libby Holman. Smith quickly became part of Libby's entourage and was extremely infatuated by her. Now remember, Smith was not officially divorced yet, but he tried to pursue Libby romantically. She was even quoted saying, wait a while, in the context of them trying to pursue a relationship. Smith was extremely persistent, and they did start to date under the radar since he was still officially married. Smith and Libby's relationship mirrored his with Anne. Tumultuous. Smith was erratic and hot-headed, and that's all I'll say about that. Now, amongst this relationship fiasco, Smith was in planning phase of the longest point-to-point -point solo circumnavigation trip of the time. This trip would clock 17,000 miles over land, and he wanted to start at December 1931, and it would end about April 1932. But before he set off on this trip, he finalized his divorce with Anne on November 23rd, 1931, and just six days later would get married to Libby on November 29th. After that, he would leave on his trip. This trip was very important to Smith. He had bought a new plane, 
built in some special features like extra fuel capacity to make it all the way. He had worked out a deal with a childhood friend, Robert Shepard, who was a reporter for the Winston-Salem Journal to write the story, but also get national attention on the story. But the trip was nothing short of a cluster and had many issues before and during. The flight would not be recorded in popular aviation history because Smith failed to complete the last 270 miles of the trip. He would last land in Zhangjiang, China, and call it quits. He'd head back to the States and settle at the family home with new wife Libby. I want to do a trigger warning as the remainder of this video discusses topics that may be troubling for some. Smith and Libby would not get to live much life together because on July 6, 1932, Smith was shot and killed. After hosting a party at the family home, it is said Smith was on the sleeping porch with his newly pregnant wife, Libby, and in the early morning hours was shot. Libby, being with her husband, of course reported hearing a gunshot, and so did Smith's friend and secretary, Albert Walker, but mystery surrounds exactly where Albert was at the time of the shooting. Smith would die later the morning of July 6 at only 20 years old. There were other party guests still at the house, but due to inebriation, and apparently the cicadas that summer were extremely loud, there were contradicting reports and lots of unanswered questions. Something I had left out when previously discussing Smith were his often remarks about committing suicide or ending it all. He had made these remarks and actually written suicide notes throughout his life. This lifelong behavior created speculation that this was actually a suicide, and Albert had reported that Smith had told him that night he was going to end it all. But again, there were so many contradicting reports, and the final autopsy said the shot was more likely a murder rather than self-inflicted. With all evidence and interviews, at first, Libby and Albert were indicted with murder, but before the case could go to trial, the Reynolds family dropped all charges in hopes to clear up further rumors and speculation. So, what happened on July 6, 1932? Over 90 years later, and there's still not really an answer. In September 2023, the Ronalda House, which is now a public museum, held a special exhibit called Smith and Libby, Two Rings, Seven Months, One Bullet, which outlined the mysterious death of Smith. You can still watch the media trailer for the exhibit and read the original coroner's request on their website. Smith never fully got to inherit his father's fortune or companies, but his inheritance did go to start the first of many Reynolds Foundations and led to the relocation of Wake Forest University to Winston-Salem. Smith left behind daughter Ann Cannon, who was only two at the time, and never got to meet his son, Christopher, who was born January 10th, 1933. Daughter Ann would go on to be known for her philanthropy and education and race relations, passing away in 2003. Christopher would tragically pass away at 17 years old in 1950 after attempting to climb Mount Whitney in California. Libby would remarry a couple of times and also adopt two more sons, Tim and Tony. She started the Christopher Reynolds Foundation in 1952 in memory of her late son, and in 1962 would found the Libby Holman Foundation. Unfortunately, she had battled years of depression and would commit suicide in 1971. Smith is buried in his family plot in Salem Cemetery in Winston-Salem. I was able to visit his stone while I was in town. As you can imagine, a family of such wealth would have magnificent plots and large memorials. Other family members buried in this plot include his father and mother, two of his siblings, one of his half-siblings, and grandmother. Neither of Smith's children or spouses are buried in this plot. When I visited, Smith's headstone had a very fitting grave good resting on top of it a small toy airplane. As always, thank you so much for joining me in this walk through some little known history. Of course, if you liked this video, give it a like, and if you're new to the AGA family, don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this.